My name is Ed Whitkind. I'm a senior advisor to the AFL-CIO and its Tech Institute, and uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce our next panel. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Cynthia Littleton. She's co-editor-in-chief of Variety. Cynthia is a seasoned writer and editor who has been covering the television beat for about 20 years. Cynthia is intimately familiar with the topic of labor and technology. She's the author of TV on Strike, Why Hollywood Went to War Over the Internet, the definitive account of the 2007-2008 Writers Guild of America strike, and the impact of the disruptive digital advancements that fueled the labor strife. Please welcome to the stage our moderator, Cynthia Littleton. Thank you. And also, please welcome our panelists, Pamela Greenwald, Nell Geyser, Jason Gordon, Catherine Kennedy, and Zachary Popel. Thank you. the home field advantage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need to use the sag after us. There we go. Okay, here we go. Well, we have a little home field advantage because Pam and I, Pam and I, have known each other a long time. We're kind of neighbors in the same neighborhood, and there's a, a real mutual respect for many, many years. Uh, I have just enormous respect for Pam and the work of that Hollywood unions do. Hollywood is unusually, uh, for sectors, it is unusually organized. The creative community, and that is definitely not lost on any of us that cover Hollywood. And you can see, you can see the gains. It is, you know, in, in the strikes that we, were, that we were just talking about, and we're going to talk about other labor actions, but in, you know, there's nothing like a recognizable face, an actor or a prominent director or, or screenwriter to help bring attention to, you know, to bring attention to a strike and to be, bring attention to labor issues. And the fact that the, that, you know, it was unfortunate, but the fact that the strife in Hollywood also happened to kind of coincide with this sort of surge around the country in various different sectors with people really standing up, workers standing up and organizing and not being, not being too hesitant to strike. It, you couldn't have planned that, but it also couldn't have been coincidental, as another, as another panelist said. It, there was a surge. There are, there's a feeling that people, workers, have been fed up and the, the previous panel was terrific. It talked a lot about the, the, the nitty gritty. I want to start with this panel to talk about how the different union leaders and campaigns, how you channeled technology to serve your ends, to get information out to people, to get people in places, bodies and picket lines, to organize the kinds of things. I would love to start with anybody that would that can give an example of how 21st century communications technology where we can all talk and tw and tweet and everything in a nanosecond how you harness that to achieve some you know some of the great achievements that unions have and i i throw that out as a jump ball to anybody who would like to give an example uh well, Jason and I share a lot in common in the way that we approach it. I will say, um, for us, uh, typical sorts of things, member communication, member education, and member outreach are um, the underlying foundation of any successful action. And we communicate with our members primarily by email. Uh, survey after survey of our membership, they tell us that email is their preferred communication. And we understand why. It comes in um, any time. They don't have to pay attention to it immediately. They can go back and search and find it when they need it. We also use some texting. We have a member mobile app that we used um, push notifications. One of the things that we really benefited from this time is social media. And there are a number of factors involved with that. <clears throat> we have an extraordinary social media team who launched our TikTok channel on the first day of the strike. We have amazing creative folks who 
announced our strike on Instagram with a black box that said um, 12F and 01. Um, that I, we, I think we picked up like 3,000 followers just from that. We were speaking the language of the people who are engaged in the fight um, in a creative way. But I also want to give some shouts to our influencer team. One of the things that we were facing was the idea, in fact, the, uh, they had said it, a couple of um, studios indicated that they were going to go to influencers to um, circumvent our strike rules around promotion. Our members aren't permitted to promote any struck product during the strike. And oh, so, yes, I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and her reference is that they couldn't do magazine interviews or have any kind of promotion publicity at all. Um, so they, they announced this, we're going to use influencers, and our influencer team was on it instantly and managed to convince several hundred of the top influencers that they did not want to be on the wrong side of this job action, which was in the right. And so that dried up a pool of potential publicity. So there were other things, but I think those, to me, were probably the top ways that we use technology. We did not use AI to draft any scripts or emails. Um, and uh, of course, we have, uh, you know, we have a video crew, so we covered everything in video, and we were all over social media with that. Um, others? I, I would just say, first of all, we're coming from, uh, uh, we have a, a lot of members that are already extremely online. Our journalist members, our film TV members, even the ones that are nowhere near famous, some of them can still have tens of thousands of followers. So we already have a built-in network that's ready to go. But really what we found that is so critical is to organize around this issue as much as you can. We have a petition for our journalist members that has over a thousand signatures that says, we are not afraid of AI. We are the ones that are going to support the way this is implemented and used, but we have the right to negotiate with you over its use. And at every bargain sessioning we do, we hand that over to management showing that all our unions are unified. The unity is so important to it. Knowing your allies, SAG after I at TSE, Teamsters, WJW West, it has just been so important to make sure that we achieve all of our goals. I'd love to, to contrast this experience. Obviously, SAG after and WGA have you know very connected members that are very articulate and can you know invest in for their jobs you know social media has become part of the job of being a screenwriter or a showrunner you you know many of them have a strong social media voice i'd love to hear from the nurses or from unite about people that may not be as facile with social media and connectivity or is that a misperception and your members were just as just as sharp on the button of getting their message out in 240 characters would love some perspective around some of your recent job actions. And you should tell us who you are and, uh, and what your role is, too. OK. Um, Thank you. Hi, uh, Zach Popple. I'm one of the research directors at the Culinary Union uh, Unite Here Local 226. Woo! So, Hometown hero. Yeah. So just the, the communications department at the Culinary Union and Unite Here is extremely aggressive, extremely comprehensive. Right. And uh, at, like we'll make sure that members know how to interact with all the, the material that is sent out and, and train them on how to forward and interact with it. I'll just say two things in addition to our social media program, because that uh, Bethany is the, the, the expert here on that. Um, and I think the way that we've been able to leverage our, our technology language is to uh, think of it as campaign language, to think of it as everyday organizing language. Uh, and I think the employers think we're crazy. Uh, and that's good because they face shop stewards and LO, people on LOA who are very well trained in the enforcement, the daily enforcement of our technology language. Uh, and that uh, involves, you know, sort of daily tracking of contract violations. But at the same time, the and this goes uh, last year, if you remember, uh, Kathy from the nurses union talked about the uh, on the, the hospital floor there being a machine that was going to determine staffing levels based on the vital signs from all the patients on that floor. Remember that. Yeah. 
that freaked me out, right? I have a sister who's a nurse. Many people have been in the hospital before. And I just knew that we had to basically take the mountain of big data that these technology and these types of equipment generate on a second to second day-to-day -day basis through the interaction of union members. They're the ones creating the, the data. And I knew that we had to basically turn the mountain of data against the employer, right? And find a way by hook or by crook to do that. And so, um, you know, basically whether it's a guest room attendant or a cocktail server, if they're interacting with a smartphone or they're interacting with a touch screen drink dispensing machine, they're generating a mountain of data on a daily basis, hundreds of thousands of rows of data. And we have to find a way to access that data, to machine read it and turn it against the company. That's something that we've been really engaged with members on. They do daily reports, right? They will, they will analyze our own spreadsheets that, that we generate and put it to use in enforcing our technology. As you start to scratch the surface, you see where, you see where it is. It is everywhere I have to take I have to take a take a, a, a slight Hollywood pause and ask how if your members have expressed any thoughts um, right now in, in the entertainment industry one of the buzziest shows out there is a show called the bear which revolves around restaurant workers and I'm just curious if that show has had any impact if, if you ever hear your members talking about that is that a, is that an honest depiction because it is it does it is presented as a warts and all uh, look at what it's like to run a restaurant. Unite Here members, uh, both present and future, right, do extremely hard physical work, right? So any depiction that shows how grueling and physically difficult it is, that that's, that's welcomed, right? So long as it's accurate and fair. Um, so I think, you know, the, the forefront of, of union members' minds are the, the sort of larger family of workers on the Strip. And, you know, we've, we've recently won some major language that will allow us to, uh, to really accelerate our organizing of non-union restaurants. So, yeah, I think that when, when sort of Hollywood is paying attention to restaurant workers, it, it's very welcome. Can Catherine, you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, you can't hear me. Oh, there. Catherine, can you talk a little bit about your role yeah. and talk about how your members have been active in, in the communications landscape about their job actions and their labor concerns? Sure. So I'm Kathy Kennedy. I'm president of the California Nurses Association, National Nurses Organizing Committee, and one of the VPs for National Nurses United. And we, have, we are blessed to have such a robust communication department um, where we are not only on Facebook, but TikTok and Instagram. Um, we, get, we are able to communicate with our nurses through that venue. Um, and, and, you know, uh, a lot... As you know, most of the nurses are on their phones, and so they, they are easily communicated. We send out a lot of nurse alerts whenever we have an action that's going on. And so it's, it's really important that we utilize the technology that we have to get the message out, especially when we're continuing to organize, not only in the state of California, but throughout the United States, um, because you know the nurses understand that the way our working conditions are uh, across the United States need to change, and that the nurses are really ready to organize. Those that are not organized want to organize. And so our communications department has been really valid and vital um, for us to uh, get our message out. So, yeah. And hi, I'm Nell Geiser. I'm the director of research for the Communications Workers of America. and. There's so much we could say about how we're bargaining over technology and how we're harnessing it. To start on the harnessing side, uh, some of our members who are whizzes, you know, we come out of the telecom industry and have organized for decades in the tech industry, so technology change and technology is in our members' blood. Um, some of our members built a video game about union organizing and uh, launched it at the Game Developers Conference a, a couple years ago. And, and, you know, it showed you how to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your coworkers. And uh, I think the boss was a cat. You know, it was, it was great. It, it was uh, not released on any major platforms. It's a little wonky if you download it, but it works on any computer. So it, it's also, it was set up as an arcade. So it brought a ton of video game workers to you know, CWA to have dialogue at the GDC, which is sort of the CES of the video game industry. And 
it also has helped, you know, um, just that whole presence has helped kickstart our organizing in video games uh, where we have uh, CBAs at small video game studios now. We have um, the Activision Blizzard uh, neutrality agreement with Microsoft and we're, we're hitting the ground running on that right now. Another example of how we use technology, I'm a researcher, right? We, we figured out, this is a, a case where we use Amazon Web Services Tesseract. We, we don't love that Amazon has the best optical um, character recognition software right now, but they do have a really good tool that we have been sharing with other unions um, and the Strategic Organizing Center has helped us develop around extracting data from uh, OSHA 300 logs. So for many of our sectors, you know, we all want to understand health and safety and injuries on the job. And so similar to Unite Here, we can extract from massive amounts of, you know, logs that have to be kept about every single injury by law and that workers have the right to uh, request from their employers we can now much more efficiently, where you, you used to have to do data entry by hand to make these things useful, you know, or copy paste every line. We can do it much more efficiently. Um, and that's a kind of good use of technology, right? Like OCR technology, transcription technology. These are things that we can use and harness in the union world and in our workplaces uh, to empower workers to, to uh, do our, our work in an effective and creative way. And uh, we've been able with that OSHA 300 log analysis to show how, for instance, with airline passenger service workers, ergonomic injuries uh, on the ramp are causing a huge percentage of injuries and bring that to Congress and say, here's what you need to put in the FAA reauthorization around a better you know, addressing of the lack of jurisdictional clarity on the ramp to keep workers safe and have them be able to consult on how to make the ramp safer so that we stop seeing fatalities on the ramp. So those are a couple examples, but you know we're also making huge headway on um, sharing through our contracts database that all our locals have access to um, mining existing language that we can update for the AI era. The News Guild um, uh, has just gotten some breakthrough language with the Associated Press that says no jobs can be replaced by AI and workers can only, you know, use AI to supplement their work with worker oversight. No jobs will be replaced, no positions will be replaced, no benefits will be eliminated because of AI at the Associated Press as of the past couple months when that language was TA'd. That's terrific, yeah, congratulations. Uh, can I follow up on that quickly with two thoughts? Oh, yeah, go ahead, yeah. So Nell made a really good point about the connections between various things that we do and how it all feeds into bargaining strategy, bargaining tactics, and ultimately bargaining victory. It is organizing, it is data, it is communications, and it's the way that you bring all of those things together in a powerful way that supports your negotiators at the table and that educates and activates your members. And I want to give a shout out to Liz and the uh, to President Schuler and the um, hub system that she created at the FLCIO. Uh, Nell mentioned the organizing uh, strategic organizing group. We relied heavily on folks in the strike unit and the strike hub to um, uh, work with us on things like uh, capital campaigning and um, investor uh, information. So w one of the ways that we prepared to approach um, the strike and communicating the issues around the strike was to make sure that folks knew the um, potential harm that was being visited upon the companies and their balance sheets. And so AFL-CIO was super helpful in providing resources, research and staff and advisory in that respect. Um, for our capital campaigns uh, component. And I also would just say without our organizers, um, we would not have had, so I um, had the honor of managing our strike for sag After, which meant that I worked less on day-to-day -day, um, communications and field things and had a more overall view and managed that team of 14 people who ran it, um, which we would not have been able to do without our organizing team 
who set up the captain's network, had folks out on the lines every day, managed the logistics. And then the last thing I'll say is we would not have been able to do it without the solidarity of unions across the country and across sectors. Definitely the entertainment industry unions. Shout out to everybody who was up on this stage in the prior panel. But also, Labor's International Union of North America, out on every picket line by the hundreds, helped us shut down Universal. Um, UFCW, Sean McGarvey at the National um, Building Trades came out um, on one of our picket lines. Jimmy Williams at the Painters, and on and on, um, including everybody right here. Nurses, every single picket line. And we thank you because the most important, most powerful thing that we had was not technology. Technology does a job. What we had was solidarity and unity and power of the people, which sounds trite, but it's true. So um, thank you all and right on. Technology very much helped you all express that. Yeah. Zachary, you were going to say? Just two quick things to follow up on what Nell said. Yeah, I think just that there's uh, staff at the AFL in DC in the headquarters that we've been working with essentially to, and just a big thanks to Kieran there, to we can take uh, about a million rows of data and feed it into a program and read it for contract violations and do it in a timely way. So we're working on that. So, so those kind of things, those, like leveraging big data and machine reading is really interesting. The second thing is we'll, in terms of direct communication with technology companies, I'll have cocktail servers or housekeepers ask like, well, when the tech company comes in to implement the technology, can I make proposals to them about how it should be configured, about how it should work in my workplace? And the answer is absolutely yes, right? So for example, we had a housekeeper, right? And she's, she's speaking in Spanish and you know, she said, well, put it up on the screen, put it in Spanish. I wanna tell you how to set it up. And we're like, yes, you can do that, right? And I just think we like telling members that, that, that that's okay, that's their prerogative, right? They don't need permission right, to make those kinds of suggestions uh, and improvements in the technology, I think is, is really important and it kind of takes that technology language, makes it part of the kind of everyday organizing wrap that's really powerful. Yep. Can I just add one thing? One of the other things that we were really able to do was we led with members first here. We had a, a captain's network that we put together where each member, for this was for the film and TV, MBA strike that happened and beforehand it was also already in place where every member had a captain, a member captain that they can reach out to so they can have direct access to the guild at any point. So they were like one person away, one degree away from guild leadership to get the information they needed. So, you know, when we're talking about all these advancements in technology, those are all helpful, but the real member to member organizing and outreach and getting talking points to everyone through the captain's network is still essential. At the same time, it's a changed landscape. So in communications, while we're looking to getting information out to people, we are using the captain's network, but we're also using not only earned media in traditional outlets like Variety, for instance, but we're also looking at all new outlets that are at the forefront of technology podcasts, we are looking at even TikTok, where there's a, a, a program that Kalina Newman over at the AFL tipped us off to called uh, Bikini Bottom News, a SpongeBob SquarePants <laughs> themed news channel that gets about 3 million viewers per news story, which is more than like Rachel Maddow gets in a given night. So tapping into those channels has been really helpful in just kind of expanding the world of who we're reaching. Let me ask you also just, I mean, certainly in the, in the Hollywood strikes, it was so powerful, the ability to have a, a tweet. I, I, I can't call it, I, I, can't, I can't wrap my head around calling it X. I'm still gonna call it a tweet. A post. A tweet, an Instagram from an individual actor with a personal story, telling a story about getting screwed on per diem or getting, you know, their, just their experiences, especially in Hollywood where there's just been this unprecedented ramp up of production that on the surface seemed great, wow, everybody's working, but behind the scenes there were so many, there were so many problems from that that were absolutely laid bare. And when people were on picket signs, they were more than happy to tell us chapter and verse how they were getting abused and just violated, you know, the contract violations day after day. It was it was really eye-opening. But let me ask you sort of the 
the yin and yang of that, you had you can absolutely platform an amazingly poignant story of an actor or a writer on a show that can barely make their rent on a show that's winning awards. At the same time, that also gives a platform to somebody who might disagree with your leadership and can make a very loud point. Oh, the leaders are not going down the right path and, and, and you know, whether deliberately or not, try to sow some seeds of dissension. How do you balance all of that at a time in a, in a strike when you've got hundreds of posts coming literally, if not every minute, every half hour? I mean, it is. it was overwhelming in the heat of that. I don't have to tell you. There were times in September I was worried about Pam. I really wanted to make sure she was getting her vitamins because she really was running that strike. And every time I saw you out there as a friend, I, was, I, could, I could see how much, I could just see the physical toll that it was taking. And it was the sacrifice that people like Pam made. I must Pam have made. awful. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> no, but, but seriously, about the kind of the, the back and forth of social media, that, that, that it can be a great platform, but it can also, certainly it's a voice for, for voices, it's a platform for voices of dissent. How did you balance that? And I, I am not, do not mean to be uh, favoring the folks I know, I really do want to hear perspective from other, from other sectors. I would say really listen to your members. That is what we did throughout the campaign. Their concerns are valid just because they may not be what the guild is in support of or what they're favoring. You have to listen to them. They're the, they make up the guild. They are the union. The workers are the union. And we will listen to them. We will give them voice. We'll give them space. When we were holding our membership meetings, our leadership stayed till the hours after the end time to make sure every member's question was answered, every concern was addressed. That's how you listen to them. And I think that it goes a long way to just give them the space to air their grievances, to listen to them, and to explain to them what proposals are. I want to say the Writers Guild of America West had a, a great team in their research department who put together really thorough research papers that kind of explained different topics to our members that we put out at strategic points during the campaign. And we worked really collaboratively with the West's comms team to make sure that this information got out. And when there was people that were like, wanted to say like, well, this doesn't really reflect my lived experience, we just listened to them, we addressed their concerns. And for, for, for nurses, it's a little different, you know. So one of the things that we re are really concerned about as it relates to AI or technology is really having the opportunity you know, in our collective bargaining agreements to make sure that we're at the table. Um, you know, as a registered nurse, one of the things that's really important is that human touch. I also heard a gentleman talk about, you know, the human-centered. You know, those are the things that we bring to the table as registered nurses because AI or technology can't tell you whether or not a person has a temperature or not. It is me being able to assess my patients, putting in that information as part of the data, you know, so what we have been doing across all of our collective bargaining agreements is have standardizing the language, the technology language, to say whenever the employer is looking to bring in any kind of technology to the workplace, one, we need to be a voice there, and also to really look to see is it going to be beneficial to help us as registered nurses to care for our patients and making sure that it's safe and effective and, and that it's not going to harm our patients. So those are things that we not only help to educate the nurses that are in the process of going through bargaining a contract, but really um, telling the employer that we are the front line. We are the ones that are doing the work, and it is so important that we have a say in that. And so our, it's a little different for us, but we're, we're there. So I would love to answer the question about diverse opinions. but. Can I just uh, add something to Please. what she said? So we'll go to Q&A in just a few minutes. <laughs> several years ago, we were uh, touring Carnegie Mellon with uh, Liz and some other folks, and um, <clears throat> your president was there. And one of the things that they were showing in a little show and tell on technology was um, a robot that fed patients. And we were all shocked 
because it's cold and it's crazy. And it's like, who would spend time developing a robot that would feed patients when every single reputable survey says that it is the warm 98.6 degree human touch, the connection of your eyes with the patient that helps a patient get well. And you'll notice there are no robotic arms feeding patients in any hospitals that I'm aware of. And this is six or eight years ago because it was foolish. And so when you talk about your members and that connection, that really made an impact on me. And it's how you can separate technology that is a tool that is useful and helps you do what you need to do, and technology that you don't even know why they're doing it because it defeats the very purpose. It's the humanity of nurses that helps patients get well. And so, which brings me then to my answer about the question about diverse opinions. Um, we're a very large union, more than 165,000 members across several different job categories. We have a robust democracy and we pride ourselves on that, that not all of our members agree. We're the size of a middle-sized American town. So you're not always going to have, even with people whose general beliefs are similar, because they're members of a union for a reason, they believe in unionism, um, and I agree with um, what Jason said. Uh, we believe in people's rights to have their own opinion, express their own opinion, and we use social media as a way to communicate the union's position and information that members need. And if some members don't agree with the union's position, that's their right and they can express it. One of the things that's happened with our social media is we've gained more followers and it's gotten bigger is that the community itself often takes over and um, sort of regulates the debate. If people are flaming or swearing or doing other things that are like super negative, the community itself, other members, other followers on our social media, try and regulate the debate and keep it civil. Um, so we support every member's right to express their opinion in any place, any time, any venue that they choose and appreciate the community that tries to keep things civil on social media. Doesn't always bring out the best in folks. Um, I, we are gonna get to questions, but I wanna ask a question of, of course, at a time of contract, you know, of, of strife around a contract and a, and, a, and a labor action or a work stoppage, members are definitely gonna be engaged during the periods when, you know, you're between contracts and there isn't so, there isn't a front burner issue how do you keep member? How do you keep the union still members knowing that it's a vital and important part of their lives? Is that do you think going to be a challenge to in the after all of all of the investment and engagement in the in a very busy summer of labor action? Are, is there going to be fatigue? Are people going to be? I'm not going to read that newsletter because I'm just so tired. And then I promise, if folks line up, we will take questions. You know, one of the things that we do um, in our organization is that we offer classes to the nurses related to, you know, AI technology and things like that. So the nurses are really engaged. And so we have a, a really good nursing education department um, within our organization, and they, we offer free CEUs. So we either do it on Zoom or in person. They live in person. And it really gives a chance for the nurses to ask specific questions. So we really try to keep them engaged you know, uh, after, you know, the collective bargaining, we have a new contract, but we keep them engaged on and on. And even if you have a contract in place, your employer might introduce a new technology, right, out of the blue. And so you have to demand effects bargaining over that. We believe, um, as the AFL-CIO does, that the NLRB actually has the authority to make technology a mandatory subject of bargaining because it implicitly impacts terms and conditions, so we should all be pushing for that to make it mandatory. And our members believe that this is something that is critical, and so I think right now, more than ever, people are staying keyed in between contracts because they're seeing these changes across a number of sectors, and we have a, a, a committee on artificial intelligence at CWA that met uh, for several months this year and produced a report and recommendations to our executive board. And that process was really engaging and an opportunity for uh, this group of, of rank and file members from telecom, media, technology, to speak with experts, to talk with their coworkers, to go out there 
and help us document what's going on and develop strategies for bargaining and public policy. So you can check those uh, AI principles out on CWA's website, and we think it's really helping us engage our membership um, in a deeper way. We're going to keep that work going. And we also, you know, we used to have uh, conventions every single year at CWA because of how deeply committed to democracy and debate and, you know, discourse our union is. Uh, now they're every two years uh, for the past couple of decades, but it's still, you know, that feeling that, you know, your union rep elected leaders are accountable to you and, and they'll only be your, you know, delegates to that convention if you put them back there. Crazy connection. I used to produce your convention and video working at a PR firm in D.C. 20 years ago. Uh, it's a small world. Any, any questions? There's a couple of microphones here. Folks want to line up. I want to, I'm going to press Pam and Jason a little bit. What are... What do you think, what, what strategies do your unions need to do? I know that your members are going to show up for IATSE and the Teamsters, no question. But what about when Unite and SEIU and the nurses unions are out? How, how do you keep that level of fire up to get bodies where they need it? I mean, we're already working with a lot of these unions. Um, AFM is about to go into negotiations. The American and, Federation of Musicians. Yes, and we're already working with them to make sure that our members know about their actions and to support them. Uh, pilot, uh, the flight attendants also have contracts coming up and we are been out at the airports with them. We are keeping our members really updated on solidarity pickets. It's really important to do and to continue to show that they, our members want that. They want to be informed. They don't see this as just a Writers Guild issue. It's a labor issue. And we are all in this together. And that's how we're going to keep winning. I agree with that completely. It crosses sectors. And Unite here, um, longtime uh, partner of ours in this summit, uh, huge friends, has our support always. Same with NNU. And um, shout to your president and uh, the retirement of Ken Zinn. Um, we um, are, so PSYCH-AFTRA has grown deeper ties within the labor movement over the last 10 or 15 years, due in large part to our leadership, to Duncan Crabtree Island and others, um, who have embedded us uh, more deeply within the labor movement, and especially the FLCIO. I joined uh, PSYCH-AFTRA 17 years ago, and that was one of the pieces of my portfolio was to keep and create and engage and build a deep connection with the FLCIO and the National Labor, Mo National Labor Movement. We have actually appointed a uh, director, an executive director of labor policy and Rebecca Damon, who also shares that goal and is making sure that we're staying connected to the movement in a way that we really never had been before. Um, what I can say is, there are no stauncher supporters of the Teamsters and the IA and the AFM and the WGA and the DGA and the Animation Guild, and I can go on and on, the studio laborers, the basic crafts, uh, than sag after We have the backs absolutely of everybody in our industry sector and beyond. So um, we've been out for Starbucks, out for Amazon, um, and on picket lines for Rebecca will have a better list than I have. Um, I think you were at the flight attendants picket in New York City. But uh, what we understand deeply and truly and is incredibly heartfelt is that our success is not just our success. Our success is because of every single union in the AFL-CIO and those without. We had support from folks uh, who are not affiliated. And what I think we understand, what all workers now understand is we rise and fall together in the labor movement. Nobody has the interests of workers in mind in the way that the labor movement does. And we will succeed together or we will fall together. I just go, did we just get the... I was just going to say, I'll keep going till they tell me to stop, but they just did. I'm just going to throw out one thing, a little personal anecdote. My son is 23 in Chicago. I'm so proud of him. He's getting his teaching credential, and he is super proud because he's working at a uh, before and after school program, and he got to be a sort of junior member 
of the Chicago, I'm probably gonna get it wrong, but this, the Chicago Teachers uh, Union. And uh, he, I, I have seen what it has. Um, Teachers in the house. I have seen what it has meant to him to understand, to connect him to a part of a larger movement. What, in, our, in just our waning moments, what do you all, what, did, what have you learned from this past summer about strategies of connecting with Generation Z or ZZ or whatever the heck they're calling themselves? Um, the union movement, the labor movement, needs to recruit more people who are familiar with Python and SQL and programming, right? That can really dig into this data, and and they're out there. There are they're in our families. <laughs> there are nerdy, you know, like sort of friends, and we have to recruit them in so that they can kind of leverage that technology. I think the same thing goes for nursing too. You know, I mean, we are the nurses. You know, I've been a nurse for 44 years, and so I'm just now learning my phone, but. You know, young kids that are coming in, uh, they just know what to do, you know? And I think it's really important that we continue to mentor and to really engage and get them to really understand the, the importance of being in a union. Nell, can you wrap it up for us? Uh, forgive me, Jason, we have to, our time is short. Uh, sure, sure, I mean, we just know how much young people support unions and are incredibly motivated to organize. Just look at undergrads who are organizing. We're we're supporting some undergrads, you know, organizing their unions. And so I don't think, you know, we have too much to teach them. We need to learn from them. How did they build their own consciousness? And how can we, you know, recognize their leadership in building the future of our unions and creatively, you know, uh, imagining new labor formations that, that rebuild sectoral power, that take power back from, uh, the one percent, and really think about uh, rebuilding uh, not just democracy but economic democracy, because young people, I think, are also much more open to being anti-capitalist, honestly, <laughs> and like questioning capitalism and how it works today. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you all you. for your time. Thank you.